<laughs> All right, I'd like to call the Finance and Law <coughs> Subcommittee to order. It's Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. Once again, we have three items on the agenda this evening. The first one is student activity requests, and because of what's going on, we don't have any at this point in time. Uh, second one is bills payable for FY20 and 21. Uh, first, we'll do FY21, $1,211,793.24. And do we have any questions on that one before we move on to the second one? No questions. And, uh, the second bills payable is FY2020, uh, last year, if you wish, uh, in the amount of $14,845.71. And that's coming off the encumbrance list. Any questions on that? Mr. Hearing Chairman, none, I, I, hearing none, I would intend, entertain, yeah, entertain a motion to uh, approve the bills payable. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we uh, pay the bills payable, the warrant FY 2021 of $1,211,793.24 and FY 2020, $14,845.71. I'll second that. And a motion has been made and seconded. And any further discussion on that motion? Mr. Souza. I just have a quick question for uh, Ms. Moynihan. Um, I noticed this, I'm curious, I, I don't remember, this is why, probably why I'm asking the question. On the food services, um, obviously a pair, the uh, student income, there's no student income for the, for the lunches, not that, that funds a certain percentage of the funding. And then we get funding from the federal government and the state and wherever else it may come from. Um, so my question is that we still have uh, our funding coming from the regular sources, the state and the federal government, that's allowing us to feed the kids uh, and all these sites. And how is that working? Uh, yes, uh, right now, Karen Papa is waiting um, from a few things from the Department of Education. But as I believe Superintendent Cabral did go ahead and list it in his uh, um, superintendent report, which I will take his thunder, um, but we will be feeding our kids again in uh, during during the day and it will be on specific sites, but I will let Mr. Cabral discuss that later on. That specifically, um, the federal government, that's where we're getting the funds from for that? Right, the, yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, no, no further questions, Mr. Chairman. So motion has been made, seconded, all those in favor? Aye. Roll, roll call. Roll call, Mr. Souza? Yes. Mr. Fiore? Yes. And Mr. Martin, vote yes. And by the way, no one caught me, but I forgot to take a roll call in the beginning, so I'll do it now. Mr. Souza, Present. Mr. Fiore? Present. And Mr. Martin, present. Uh, catch me on those things. Uh, the facilities update, anything new with facilities? I'm looking at Ms. Bonahan. Yes, I'll just do a brief one. Um, as you well know um, that we did get the substantial completion for Mulcahy Elementary, James L. Mulcahy Elementary School on August 21st. Uh, we are about 96% complete with the project. So what's really left over, it's, um, of course, there's a punch list going on inside of the building, but also some site work that needs to be done. Um, striping up the parking lot, sideways need to be fixed up, the finishing up of the playground, but pretty much we're going through quite a bit of um, growing pains as we start a whole new school year with all new technology in that building and all new phone systems. But uh, Principal Dakota and Assistant Principal um, Nichols have been working very hard with all of their staff and to get everybody ready to go. So, uh, and um, that's it for me. Thank you. Any further business for finance and law this evening? We adjourn. So, second. Motion has been made and seconded, Mr. Souza. Yes. Mr. Fiore. Yes. Mr. Mont votes yes. We are adjourned. Thank you, Steve. All right, Steve, <clears throat> bye guys. Thank you. Call the meeting to order. Mrs. Fagan, if you could do the roll call and the prayer, please. Yes, I will. Um, Lord, as we begin this session, let us acknowledge your goodness and mercy and ask your blessings on all our deliberations. We thank you for this opportunity to be of service to the community and to the young people entrusted to our care. Amen. Amen. Ms. Doherty? Present. Mr. Pulowski? Present. Mr. Fiore? Present. Mrs. Fagans, present. Mr. Martin? Present. Mrs. Almeida? Present. 
Mr. DeMello? Present. Mr. Souza? Present. And Mayor O'Connell? Present. And we'd like to have a moment of silence for two people who contributed an awful lot to our community. The first one is Barbara Laughlin, who served in many roles, who absolutely loved being in this city, was very active, including being the mayoral assistant for Mayor Richard Johnson. Her daughter, Joanne, was a longtime science teacher at Thornton High School. And also for Mr. Ed Lancaster, a longtime custodian at the uh, at Cole School, he was very active in the Taunton West Little League. And I understand he really loved the PACC and playing cards down there. So that let us um, extend our sympathies to their families. And I'd like to also honor their memories by remembering both of them as kind, caring individuals who are nice to everybody. And let us honor their memories by remembering that a little kindness goes a long way. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our prayers and blessings are with the families. Okay, um, approval of the minutes from August 5th, 19th, and September 20th. So moved. Second. Second. A uh, motion made and seconded to approve the minutes on a roll call, please, Mrs. Fagan. Yes, Ms. Doherty. Yes. Mr. Plowski. Yes. Mr. Fiore. Yes. Mrs. Fagan votes yes. Mr. Martin. Yes. Mrs. Almeida. Yes. Mr. DeMello. Yes. Mr. Souza. Yes. Thank you. Uh, public input, Mr. Souza. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is the uh, September 16th Martin School Committee meeting. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Section 30A-18 in the Governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public meeting of the Taunton School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this public hearing will be held remotely with no physical meeting location. Those seeking to provide public input should do so using the method that I'm going to read following. The meeting will be aired live on the Taunton Educational Network, Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 23 in Taunton. The meeting can also be viewed via live stream at https colon forward slash forward slash THS TV studio, all one word, dot VOD dot CAS TUS dot TV. A recording of the meeting will be made Available on the aforementioned THS TV studio cactus account website, as well as the Titan Educational Network YouTube channel at http colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash c slash THS TV studio. It will also be rebroadcasted multiple times on the Titan Educational Network cable channel. Public input via phone right now during the meeting is 508-821-1221. And Mr. Jakes has that up on the screen right now. That's 508-821-1221. Leave a voicemail if there's no one answers, if necessary, and we include your name and address for the record. If you're calling in, we will need your name and your, your address for the record. Meeting will be recorded and posted on the Taunton Public Schools website at www.tauntonschools.org. Mr. Martin. I just want to people who may call in to realize that it's the committee's policy not to respond to what they say. It isn't, the, <clears throat> we will take what they say under advisement, seriously under advisement, but we don't comment when they finish speaking. So I don't want them to think that, you know, they just went out before us and said something and we just tossed it aside. We take what they say under advisement. Thank you. That's right. And, and if it's um, 
and we will have the administration respond as, necess as necessary if that warrants at that time. So right now the public input line is open and I will talk to Mr. Cabral, who, the, uh, who has the public input line. Mrs. Moynihan is covering the public input, input line and I believe she does have a call. Uh, Ms. Moynihan, do you have a call? Yes, I do. Um, go ahead, Mrs. Rogers. Hi, my name is Cameron Rogers, and I live at 30 Freitas Ave. And I just want to start off by saying that I know you guys have all worked really hard, and I have a lot of, you know, teachers in my family, so I hear it all. Um, but my main concern is I, I do have a first grader, and there's just a lot of technical challenges for him. Um, unfortunately, he's with his grandmother because I have to work, and we didn't realize, like I said, someone would have to be there next to him for most of the majority of time. Um, just moving around the mouse and trying to figure out what to do. And the other only concern I have is that the time spent on the computer for him, I feel, is a really long time. Um, just with concerns of him saying, my eyes hurt. I'm just so tired from sitting here. And I know they have breaks and lunch and all that, but I just personally feel that if there was any way for like the younger kids to be back to school sooner than later, um, I just feel like it's it's just such a loss of learning and a decline and like I kind of feel like he's regressed a little um, and really that's all, that's my concern as a parent. Thank you very much and please leave your number with uh, Ms. Moynihan and the, um, thank you. Any other public? Oh, I'll wait till Mrs. Moynihan gets that line. Wendy, there's no email uh, public input, correct? I didn't see any or receive any. No, I didn't receive any other. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Moynihan, is that it? Oh. That was my last call. Okay. Uh, we'll wait, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, you can time it another minute and then you can close it. How's that? Sure. Hi, I have one other call. I have Karen Harper, and here you go. Ms. Harper, you may go ahead and, um, and state your name and your address. Hey, my name is Karen Harper. I live at 1020 Middleborough Ave in East Taunton. And like the caller before just said, I'm very thankful for all the work that the administrators and teachers have done to make the school year possible for the children. However, one of my children is diagnosed with ADHD and is having a very difficult time following along with remote learning all day long. David, uh, Mr. Souza. We have been in multiple loop and breaks, um, fidgets to um, play with, hard candy gum, all other strategies we know of, but it's very difficult for him to stay focused. Mr. Susan, would you like to respond? Hey, thank you. Please leave your name and number. Uh, please leave your number, and uh, the administration will have someone get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Harper. Hold on, and maybe. She's on the phone again. Maybe she has one more. Ms. Moynihan, how are we doing? Uh, any, any other further calls? As of right now, we are all set. Madam Mayor, I say public input is closed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, superintendent's report, Mr. Cabral. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So in your packet, you should have a letter or uh, uh, update from me uh, regarding our welcome back, which was held virtually. So before we get started, I do want to thank Mr. Jakes for his outstanding efforts in helping to coordinate this year's uh, welcome back celebration in which we brought back staff. So on September 11th, 2020, the Tom Public Schools officially welcomed back staff to school. Unlike previous opening days, which was held in person, this year our welcome back festivities were held virtually. So the festivities were kicked off with our own mayor, Madam, Ma Madam Mayor Sean O'Connell, kicked things off by welcoming all the Taunton Public School employees back on behalf of the city. Mayor O'Connell's comments were soon followed by school committee chairperson David Souza and Taunton Education Association President James Qu Quaintance, who also offered welcome back addresses to all the faculty in attendance. And despite our virtual setting, the Taunton Public Schools once again acknowledged all public school employees with 35 plus years of service. So in addition to recognizing members of this prestigious group currently servicing our students throughout the district, this was also a time to welcome three new members joining the 35 plus years of service club. Now school committee chairperson David Souza and I had the honor of reading each name aloud as certificates were passed uh, across the screen via Zoom. So we really had to um, you know, really test our limits when it came to technology and how to pass those certificates across the screen. So please join me in welcoming you know, the newest members to the 35 plus years of service club. The newest members are Nancy Santos. She's an educational assistant at the East Taunton Elementary School. Donna Shobbs, the math curriculum supervisor at Taunton High School. And also Joan King, who's a senior cook and I believe she's at the Mulcahy Elementary School. So these three members join a very prestigious group who are comprised of Richard Bridey, a seventh grade science teacher at Friedman, Ann Noons, who's a sixth grade teacher at Friedman Middle School as well, Jean Brown, an educational assistant at East Town Elementary School, Susan Burquist, who's a first grade teacher at the Chamberlain Elementary School, Lynn McKenzie, a third grade teacher at the Chamberlain Elementary School, Lisa Penn, who's a speech pathologist here at E. Paul Elementary School. And last but not least, Catherine McCrillis, a cafeteria helper at the Benjamin A. Freeman Middle School. So congratulations to their outstanding service and dedication to the students and staff throughout the school system. So once again, I had the pleasure of addressing the staff on opening day. Uh, highlights of my welcome back address focused on resilience and perseverance. Similar to how our community and nation persevered after the tragic events on 9-11, staff were reminded that we will overcome all obstacles associated with educating our students throughout the pandemic. It helped make the correlation, our mayor, school committee, principals, and leadership team members all took turns reading a passage from a children's tale, The Little Engine That Could. And we're gonna share that passage or share that reading with the public shortly. The story epitomizes the value of optimism and hard work. Both are core values deeply embedded in the DNA of our teaching staff. After some additional comments, my opening day address concluded with a short video montage containing photos highlighting the perseverance of our students and staff throughout the pandemic, which we will also share with the public. We were very excited to have a keynote speaker this year. So our keynote speaker was George Kuros. So Mr. George Kuros provided our staff with an outstanding presentation that centered on the shift of technology and how it relates to education. George Kuros has been involved with education for over 20 years and has focused on the areas of innovative leadership, teaching and learning. He has worked at all levels of K-12 education as a teacher, technology facilitator, and school and district administrator. He is a sought after speaker on the topic of innovative leadership, student learning and empowerment, and has worked at schools and organizations around the world, and is the author of the best-selling book, The Innovator's Mindset. Mr. Kuros delivered a powerful message to our staff, reminding everyone that despite all the advances in technology, not much has changed fundamentally with regards to education. The tools and software in which instructions are delivered may be changing at a rapid rate. However, the basic principles of teaching and learning have not changed and remain firmly grounded in our ability to form meaningful relationships with our students. Also, everyone was reminded not to fear change or innovation. Mr. Kuros provided many examples 
of how people can adapt, but it is by necessity or by choice. Overall, Mr. Kuros's keynote address was a huge success and resonated with staff who were grateful for his presentation. And to this day, as I visit schools, I still am bombarded by comments from staff who were just overwhelmed and pleased and thought his message hit home, especially during this pandemic. So his presentation caused many to laugh, cry, and think critically about the mindset, their own mindset, when it comes to change. So overall, the 2020-2021 opening day may not have been held using the same format that we have grown accustomed to here in Taunton. However, as we have modeled in the past, the Taunton Public Schools will continue to improvise, adapt, and overcome any challenges that get in our way. I wish to thank our mayor, school committee principals, and leadership team for contributing to another successful opening day ceremony. And lastly, a special thank you to Mr. Stephen Jakes for all his efforts as the 2020-2021 opening day ceremony would not have been possible without Steve's efforts. So thank you, Steve. So Steve, with that being said, how about we queue up the uh, reading of the little engine that could? And I think those in the public may recognize or may see some familiar faces during this reading. Chug, 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 puff, puff, puff. The little train ran along the tracks. She was a happy little train. Her cars were full of good things for boys and girls. There were all kinds of toy animals. Giraffes with long necks, teddy bears with no necks, and even a baby elephant. There were all kinds of dolls, dolls with blue eyes and yellow hair, dolls with brown eyes and brown hair, and the funniest clown you ever saw. There were toy trucks, airplanes, and boats. There were picture books, games, and drums to play. The little train carried every kind of toy that boys and girls could want, but that was not all. The little train carried good things to eat too. Big round oranges, fat red apples, long yellow bananas, fresh cold milk, and lollipops to eat after dinner. The little train was taking all these good things to the other side of the mountain. How happy the boys and girls will be to see me. They will. They'll love the toys and the food that I'm bringing. But all at once, the little train came to a stop and she didn't move at all. Oh dear, said the little train, what can be the matter? She tried to start up again. She tried and tried, but her wheels just would not turn. We can help, said the toy animals. The clown and the animals climbed out of their cars. They tried to push the little train, but she did not move. We can help too, said the dolls, and they got out and tried to push. Still the train did not move. The toys and dolls did not know what to do. Just then, a shiny new engine came puffing down another track. Maybe that engine can help us, cried the clown. He began to wave a red flag. The shiny new engine slowed down. The dolls and toys called out to him. Our engine is not working, they said. Please pull our train over the mountain. If you do not, the boys and girls will not have any toys or good food. The shiny new engine was a bit friendly. You want me to pull you up? He asked. That is not what I do. I carry people. They sit in cars with soft seats. They look out the windows. They eat in nice dining cars. They even sleep in a fine car. I pull the likes of you? I should say not. Off went the shiny new engine without another word. How sad all the toys and dolls felt. Then the toy clown called out. Here comes another engine, a big strong one. Maybe this engine will help us. Again, the clown waved his flag. The big strong engine came to a stop. The toys and dolls called out together. Please help us big strong engine. Our train is not working, but you can pull us over the mountain. You must help us but the boys and girls will not have any toys to play with or good food to eat. But the big strong engine did not want to help. I do not pull toys, he said. I pull cars full of heavy logs. I pull big trucks. I have no time for the likes of you. In a way puffed the big strong engine, 
without another word. By this time, the little train was no longer happy, and the dolls and toys were ready to cry. But the clown called out, look, look, another engine is coming. A little blue engine, a very little one. Maybe this engine will help us. The little blue engine was a happy engine. She saw the clown waving his red flag and stopped at once. What is the matter, she asked in a kind way. Oh, little blue engine, cried the dolls and toys. Will you pull us over the mountain? Our engine is not working. If you do not help, the boys and girls will have no toys or good food. Just over the mountain. Please, please, please help us. Oh my, said the little blue engine. I am not very big. And I do not pull trains. I just work in the yards. I have never even been over the mountain. But we must get there before the children wake up, said the toys and the dolls. Please, the little blue engine looked at the dolls and the toys. But we must get there before the children wake up, said the dolls and toys. Please, the little blue engine looked at the dolls and toys. She could see they were not very happy. She thought about the children on the other side of the mountain. Without toys or good food, they would not be happy either. The little blue engine pulled up close. She took hold of the little train. The toys and dolls climbed back into their car. At last, the little blue engine said, I think I can climb up the mountain. I think I can, I think I can. Then the little blue engine began to pull. She tugged and she pulled. She pulled and she tugged. Puff, puff, chug, chug went the little engine. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, she said. Slowly, slowly, the train started to move. The dolls and toys began to smile and clap. Puff, puff, chug, chug. Up the mountain went the little blue engine. And all the time she kept saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Up, 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 the little engine climbed and climbed. At last, she reached the top of the mountain. Down below lay the city. Hooray, hooray, cried the dolls and the animals. The boys and girls will be so happy, said the toy clown, all because you helped us, little blue engine. The little blue engine just smiled, but as she puffed down the mountain, the little blue engine seemed to say, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could. Thank you, Steve. So uh, as George Kuros reminded us on opening day, you know, we use the power of story to connect with our students, and to teach them lessons. And something as simple as a childhood story can teach adults many lessons. So thank you to all my guest stars for their appearances. You guys, uh, you guys were outstanding. I think you all have a future on the app Cameo. So uh, you might want to uh, market yourselves on Cameo. Maybe uh, you know, generate some addition, additional, uh, an additional cash flow uh, for, for your homes. So Steve, would you mind uh, queuing up the PowerPoint presentation? And as Steve queues up the PowerPoint presentation, I'd also like to take this moment to introduce three principals who are with us this evening. So I'd like to formally introduce uh, Jennifer Peters. Jennifer Peters is serving as the interim, or, sorry, the acting principal at the Chamberlain Elementary School. So welcome, Jennifer. I'd also like to welcome Danielle Kurt, uh, elementary school principal, middle school principal, sorry, at the Benjamin A. Freeman Middle School, and also assist head, sorry, Principal Mattos from Taunton High School who's also here with us this evening. I've asked all three to join us so that they can share uh, some highlights and also some of the hiccups that we've experienced during the first three days of remote learning. So Mr. Jakes uh, will walk us through the presentation real quick and then I'll allow Jen, Danielle and Matt to offer some commentary regarding how the first three days of remote learning went in their respective buildings. So the, the first slide I'd just like to highlight, if you can go back to the first slide, please, Steve. Uh, some of you may not have noticed, or some of you may have noticed, that I, I embedded the new Torch logo. So part of our work uh, this year, which got sidetracked due to COVID, is to revise our strategic plan. So as part of the revision for our strategic plan, we have a new Torch, uh, which I'm calling uh, Torch 2.0. So it's really the evolution of the work that has taken place uh, under the previous administration, which I was part of with Dr. Hackett. So we're looking to continue that work and our torch has evolved. Uh, you'll notice that we still you know, believe in trust, optimism, 
respect, collaboration, high expectations, hard work, and we added an E for equity. So that'll be the new torch that we'll be used and utilizing throughout the school system uh, for what I believe will be many, many years to come. Thank you, Steve. Oh, and I need to, I, the torch would not have been possible uh, without the efforts of CBTE co-director Dala Hatung, graphics, graphic art teacher, Cheryl Kimber, and most importantly, graphic arts intern, class of 2020, Kristen Herald, for their outstanding work in taking uh, my vision, or taking our vision, and developing what, uh, what is the new torch, which I think is a great logo. So thank you, Steve. Next slide, please. So I've had the pleasure of visiting every school uh, in, the, in, this, in this city of Taunton, except for three, uh, which I will visit next week. But when, one of my first visits was to the Bennett Elementary School. And uh, you can see when I walked in, I was very pleased to see what was waiting for me and also what was waiting for our teachers when they arrived. You know, so I, I have to commend the administration at Bennett you know, for their hard work in making everyone feel very welcomed and inviting uh, to what we believe is the better new normal. Next slide, please, Steve. In the next slide, you see, I wanted to share with you some photos of our high needs learners. So these are our high needs learners over at the Friedman Middle School in one of our high needs programs. Next slide, please, Steve. And you'll notice that the students are appropriately spaced and all students are wearing their masks and the teachers are centered at their workstation. Next slide, please, Steve. Again, this student receiving a little more direct instruction. And again, you see the student and the teacher both wearing their mask and working through whatever glitches or ass assisting the student uh, with on, uh, while they're learning on their Chromebook. Next slide, please, Steve. Again, just another classroom where you see the educational assistant positioned in the rear of the room. The teacher, which you, who you cannot see, is in the front of the classroom. And I believe this is a seventh grade TLC classroom at the Friedman Middle School. Next slide, please, Steve. Again, another, another photo. Uh, in this one, this was interesting because the teacher was actually teaching the students in front of her, as well as working with the students who were home remotely. So uh, this teacher was, was able to uh, access or provide instruction, deliver instruction to students in person, as well as the students remotely. So uh, hats off to this teacher for her hard work. Uh, here you see Mrs. Kaleri, music teacher, over at Friedman, uh, very excited to log in and teach her music class. Next slide, please, Steve. You can also see there was excitement throughout the city for students who were attending remotely. So I think this is something you see a lot of parents sharing on social media. You know, they like to take pictures of the kids year to year to show the growth. So here we have two second graders who are ready for back to school, donning their masks. Next slide, please, Steve. And here you see uh, two students sharing a home office at home, they have their little workspace all set up, replicated to feel like a home office or to feel like a learning environment they'd have at school. And next slide, please, Steve. Again, you have an older student. So we have a high school student with his workspace set up and you have a younger student with a backpack getting ready for learning. So hats off to the community for really embracing our remote learning plan. Next slide, please, Steve. Uh, I need to commend Karen Papa. So these are the meals that we are distributing uh, at nine meal sites. Uh, which I have the flyer located. So in, when receiving the meals, students and parents will also receive heating instructions. So one of the hiccups that we have noticed uh, out of the gate is the distribution of meals. So that is something that we need to re-examine and come up with a better way to ensure parents and students have access to these quality meals that, uh, that Mrs. Papa is providing. So right now they are served at sites and the, the hiccup that we've run into is the time in which it is needed to leave home pick up the meal and return home and have the student administer the meal. So we're looking at ways to possibly street, speed up the distribution of our meals throughout the community. Next slide. And this was what I was uh, greeted to when I entered, I believe it was East Taunton Elementary School. So it was nice to see on the ground, it's going to be a great year. So we want to let everyone know that this isn't the start that we were hoping for, but we believe it's important that we learn and master our remote plan and continue to strive and work towards getting students into our buildings under our hybrid model plan. Uh, with that said, I'll, I'll uh, I'd ask uh, Ms. Peters or Principal Peters. So again, welcome to the Tom Public Schools. Uh, we 
I welcomed you at the last meeting, but unfortunately you were tied up or up to your eyeballs distributing Chromebooks. So today, if you'd like to say anything or to the school committee, you are welcome to, but I also would like the, the school committee and the public to hear how the first three days of remote learning went at the Chamberlain Elementary School. Sure, um, so th thank you for having me. Um, I know um, I was able to see the replay of the school committee meeting, so I know uh, Mr. Cabral already kind of gave me a little bit of an introduction, but I've been in Taunton for about 13 years, starting my 14th, I believe. Um, and I taught at Chamberlain and Letty and Hopewell and um, a variety of elementary grades. And then most recently, the past three years, I've been the assistant principal at Chamberlain. And um, I'm just really looking forward to seeing where um, the remainder of my career takes me in Taunton. Um, you know, I've, I've spent my entire career here, so I'm, you know, looking to finish it here too. <laughs> um, you know, as far as uh, the start of the school year, I think if I, if I had to have a word that, um, you know, one word to describe it, I guess I would go uncharted. Um, we, we've really been embarking on a completely new journey that we're essentially making the routes on the map as we travel down them. And we've, you know, we've really done our due diligence. So we've packed our bags, we have all the tools we need to be successful, but obviously that doesn't prevent us from the challenges that can arise. And, you know, the thing that I love about Taunton is that we have a very committed community and we're learning how to unite this value so that we can ignite, you know, a big a spark that allows us to shine brighter than we ever have. And I really, I, I really do believe that, um, you know, and, and throughout this year, we're, we're going to encounter a lot of new um, you know, whether it's new normal, new, new, whatever, it's going to be new. And we're going to have to stick together in order to do that. And, um, you know, when I say that the first few days went well for us, it's because that I'm, I'm proud that as a Chamberlain community, we've been asking for directions and we've been using the tools that we've been given and that, you know, we've, we've stuck together. We've really united. Um, and despite all that, you know, despite what's happening, we just keep going. And, um, you know, I like to refer to this to the staff as our resilience and how we can really use this as a model for our, our students and our families. And eventually we'll, we'll have created something that there was nothing there before. So I, I'm, I'm excited to go down this journey. Um, I know that there's going to be hiccups and I know that we're at Chamberlain, we're talking about all the learner variability when it comes to tech skills and meeting the students where they're at. And um, we're just, we're gonna continue to do that and continue to listen to our families and, and, and go from there. Thank you, Mrs. Peters. Uh, next, I'd ask Mrs. Kurt to provide a perspective from a middle school. Thank you, I would agree with Ms. Peters. We also had a very successful beginning um, few days of school. And I'd like to thank you all for having me here tonight. Those of you that know me know that one of my favorite pastimes is to worry about everything that I possibly can worry about. So you can imagine how many sleepless nights I had leading up to Monday. When I walked around the school, I literally had tears in my eyes because my biggest fears didn't come true. It was unbelievable what I saw. I had students logged in. We had over 97% attendance, which is better than a typical first day of school. Um, our students were logged in, the teachers were smiling, the kids were smiling. It was truly amazing. So everything I had feared ended up working out and that's probably a lesson for all of us to learn from. The stuff we worry about probably isn't gonna happen as bad as we had anticipated. So our attendance was great, our kids were logging in. Obviously there were some technological issues. The whole world is on Google Classroom right now. So you can imagine that would create a bit of a problem. Um, our tech team, they deserve all the love in the world because they are working nonstop to get these computers up and running every second they're working, working, working. So they're doing a phenomenal job and I'd be remiss if I didn't give a special shout out to Mr. Bernard, our assistant principal, our guidance, our staff, our teachers, and of course our parents and our students. Without them, this wouldn't have been pulled off. Um, and again, we just have to remember that we need to continue to be flexible and patient because this is a learning curve for all of us. None of us have been through this and you referenced Mr. Bridie before. He's been around for a long time and he's in there and he's teaching and he's engaging with the students and he has class pets and he's virtually showing the class pets. So if he can do it, we all can do it. So again, I thank you all for your continued patience and support. And we got this taught and right, Mr. Cabral? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kerr. 
And uh, next, we'll have Mr. Matos give us a perspective from the high school and how the first three days went. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, myself and Mrs. Keenan walked around to a lot of classrooms on Monday and Tuesday, and we kind of uh, Zoom bombed uh, a bunch of these students as they were inside their rooms. And uh, we saw a lot of happy, smiley faces. The, uh, the teachers were upbeat. And um, I'd like to think that uh, due to a lot of the efforts of, uh, you know, the technology department, Carolyn Blano, uh, you know, central office, and uh, all the high school administration and the curriculum supervisors, uh, our teachers are, uh, you know, well more prepared than they were during last spring. And uh, they're doing such an amazing job inside the classroom, uh, not just with their curriculum, but allowing the students to interact with one another. Uh, with all of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the operating functions that we have with regards to remote learning, you know, not just the, uh, you know, the Padlet, you know, the uh, Go Formative, the Pear Deck, the Flipgrid, you know, uh, Go Guardian, Edge Elastic, all the stuff that, uh, you know, our teachers have been provided with. Uh, the teachers are rolling it out and the students are engaged. And uh, it seems as if everybody is much more comfortable in the classroom setting than they were last spring. So that's a testament to pretty much all of you in the room and all the people who work so hard to get that done. Uh, to the point where I'd like to share a quick email, if I may. It's from uh, one of our students, Anna Rodriguez. We all know Anna. She's a wonderful individual. Um, also, just want to put it out there, Mr. Matos. I don't know what type of PD or training you guys did, but all my teachers were so much more comfortable and proficient with Google Meet and extensions and apps than I would have ever guessed. Incredible. So that's from a student who's also realizing uh, our efforts have been elevated. And, um, you know, like all the, uh, the other principals have stated, um, our teachers, uh, you know, of course they miss our students, but we want everybody to be safe. And, and right now, um, the way that we're engaging is, uh, you know, the best way for us to engage at this point in time. So we're very happy with our start at Taunton High School. And, uh, you know, we had a great Wednesday remote day today, professional development, and we're looking forward to uh, Thursday and Friday. So um, I like the way things are rolling up here at Taunton High, and we're very happy with the start. Thank you, Mr. Matos. Thank you, Mrs. Kerr, and thank you, Mrs. Peters. And I think the key takeaway is engagement. Uh, uh, we, we heard the concerns from our parents during the remote phase last year, and that there was little engagement. And one of the one of the area key focus points coming out of the gate was to be highly engaged with our students, to connect with our students, and to allow them opportunities to unpack, you know, talk to each other, talk to your teacher, connect with your teacher and uh, just really process everything that's taken place. Now, our teachers are teachers. So when you put a teacher in front of a class, they're gonna teach and kids are gonna learn. But we really wanna drive home the engagement piece. And I'm very proud that the engagement piece is, a, is at a very high level and teachers are figuring it out. So uh, again, shout outs to all of you for making this happen and for the school committee and, um, you know, and our mayor you know, for being supportive of how we are rolling this out. And again, the ultimate goal, we want kids in front, we want kids back in school as soon as possible in a safe manner. But again, should we have to pivot and go to remote, we will we'll feel comfortable knowing that we have a good grasp on how to teach remotely. Uh, so Mr. Jakes, if you wouldn't mind queuing up the final portion of my superintendent's report slash school committee presentation. Uh, so this is how we ended our convocation day. Uh, so one day after leaving work, I was driving home and this song was on the radio. And at this song, for some reason, the words just really connected with me and it just re kind of reminded me, I think, what everyone is feeling throughout this pandemic. So I'll let you sit back, listen, relax, and enjoy, and just listen to the words, listen to the song, because I believe all of us, you know, because of the pandemic, we've learned to live, we've learned to give, and we've learned to love again.
thank you, Mr. Jakes. And I just need to let everyone know, Jakesy put that together on about what? Two hours notice, Steve? <laughs> so, so thank you, Steve, for helping to put it together. And again, um, I think that's gonna be our theme song for the year, folks. So that concludes my superintendent's report and that concludes the presentation. I wanna thank uh, the three principals who joined us this evening. And I'm sure if there were any questions, our principals would be happy to answer them or I'd be happy to answer them along with the leadership team. I just want to say thank you for the, to the three principals. Oh, I, you have one. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. Thank you to the three principals for coming tonight, and thank you for your presentations. Uh, a lot of hard work. Keep up the good work, and uh, we'll get through this. Thank you, Mr. Souza. Okay, if we're all set then. Um, oh, Mrs. Doherty? just want to unmute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to... Uh, say thank you, hats off to everyone who has uh, stepped up and done uh, on behalf of our kids the most wonderful things that we can think of. There'll be glitches, as you pointed out, Superintendent, but those can be ironed out. And I also want to say hats off to the families who have gotten their children ready, created spaces for them, and just just decided to go along with what, what we're recommending, making some suggestions and recommendations. But helping out so that we'll all be successful. So I have two questions. How many youngsters do you know, Superintendent, that have come in live in those categories of C and D, I think you said, um, in the uh, overall? I, I don't have the actual attendance numbers, but I know we were expecting around 500 students when it's all said and done to be in person in our schools. And they're all over the district, right? Every school has a so yeah, throughout, throughout the district, and a part of that 500 number will include students in preschool who are starting next week as well. And so our, our EL population, our high needs population, uh, our preschool population, and then we'll be bringing in our McKinney Vento and our foster care students as well. And just a real quick question about the meals. So I see that we're serving on Mondays and Wednesdays. So we're not assuming that families go hungry on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. So how, how does that work? Great question, Mrs. Doherty. So Mrs. Papa has been allowing families to double up so that they have enough meals for multiple days, not just one day. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You're welcome. Okay. If we're all, uh, Mr. Pulaski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to all the teachers in Tom Public Schools. Um, I can only speak for the uh, perspective of my two kids at Tom High, uh, but the remote learning, the teachers have really upped their game from, from last year. Um, so it's just a testament to the really hard work of the dedicated educators at Tom Public Schools. So I appreciate it and please keep up the good work and good luck with the rest of the school year. Thank you, Mr. Pulowski. And, uh, Thank you everyone for those presentations and sharing the first, day of, first days of school with us. Um, and, and also a, a, a big um, thank you to the parents, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, the older kids who are helping the younger kids at home. And I know that we're always keeping in mind um, the folks that are struggling and needing our help and providing that support for them. So um, thank you all. All right, so I think we can move on now. Uh, Mr. Uh, I just sorry. I just wanted to let the principals know because this is always that awkward moment. Do you stay on the Zoom or do you log off the Zoom? So I just want to let the three principals know that I appreciate them being with us this evening. You are more than welcome to stay. However, I understand if you need to log off. I see some of you are still at work or some of you are in your home office. So I'm sure you got a lot to do to get ready for our kids tomorrow. So thank you for being with us this evening. All right. Thank Madam Mayor, the uh, chair needs to entertain a motion to accept the superintendent's report. Oh, oh. right. Thank you. Uh, so, motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, motion made and seconded to accept a report. On a roll call vote, please, Mrs. Fagan? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Pulowski? Yes. Mr. Fiore? Yes. Mrs. Fagan votes yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Almeida? Yes. Mr. DeMello? Yes. And Mr. Souza? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, is there any administrative business? None, none this evening. Uh, subcommittee reports, uh, Finance and Law Subcommittee, Mr. Martin? 
finance and law met earlier this evening with myself, Mr. Fiore, Mr. Souza. Uh, also in attendance are Superintendent Cabral and Mr. Monaghan, Assistant Superintendent Ms. Monaghan. We had three items on the agenda this evening, the first being student activity requests. And as I said during the meeting, based on what's going on, we didn't have any, and we haven't had any in quite a while. Uh, the second item was bills payable, and we had two bills payables, one for FY21 and one for FY20. FY21 was $1,211,793.24, and FY20, which is the encumbrance list, uh, was $14,845.71, and that was uh, approved by the uh, Financial Law Subcommittee. And finally, we had a facilities update from Ms. Monaghan. Uh, the Mulcahy School is uh, substantially complete. It's approximately 96% complete. Most of the work that needs to be done now is a punch list and some site work that's needed outside. Of, <clears throat> if you've gone by, you can see what we're talking about. Uh, we also had uh, some questions from Mr. Souza regarding lunch, and that was handled during the, Mr. Cabral's uh, superintendent's report. And uh, that's the uh, report of the Finance and Law Subcommittee. Uh, motion we accept the report and adopt the recommendations of the subcommittee. Is there a second? Second. Second. Motion made and seconded. Mr. DeMello? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, through you, Mayor, to either the superintendent or Mrs. Monaghan, I apologize I didn't send an email like I usually do, but uh, my professional life got in the way. Uh, is there a way that we could get a summary of the uh, instructional software? Uh, because I, I know that it's coded differently. Uh, for example, something's co coded instructional software, some is maintenance and so forth. And, and what I seem to add up, it's about $258,000. Um, is, is, can we get a quarterly report, or I don't know if a quarterly is the right way to do it, but maybe a monthly report of software? Because I know that in FY20, there was a substantial amount of soft software that we purchased. And when I see an amount of two hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars in this one warrant, uh, you know, I just want to know if we can get a, a kind of a summary so we know where we stand. If that's possible, that's my first comment, Mr. Martin. Do you want to? I, I would suggest that Miss Monaghan, when she does her quarterly report, just indicate that uh, that line in the line item, uh, because you do give us a line item report, and maybe bring it to everyone's attention, you know, to satisfy what Mr. Mr. Demel is looking for highlight it in some way or, or just bring it up uh, to answer his questions. Yeah, I, I guess that, that's separate. part of it, but maybe, you know, what we're spending it on because it's not, I mean, it's just that the comment of instructional software. Um, I don't know if we can expand upon that because I'm seeing, I mean, one, one observation is on page three, uh, Florida virtual school instructional software, $145,164, uh, $64, I apologize. So, you know, all this may be, there's a way of expanding it. I just, I see Florida Virtual School. I, I never heard that name before. So maybe yeah. I need a little bit more of an understanding. If I, I was if just I, going to say part of that explanation that she gives could include where it's going and who it's going to. Yeah, and if I could real quick to um, Madam Mayor, to Mr. DeMello, point. So the Florida Virtual School, so as part of building our learning management system, we also purchased two libraries of content for our teachers to utilize during remote learning. So Florida Virtual provides our teachers with library of content for K through six. And we also purchased Edgenuity uh, to use from, from middle school through high school. And that was purchased through a, a request for proposal done by the state. So those are the two approved platforms to support online learning, to also support hybrid learning, and to support our teachers. So, and, and I believe both uh, with that you'll see on the you'll see on the warrant too. It was charged, I think, either to the CARES grant or to the P25 grant, which is another federal grant that we are receiving. So again, that's just to support our remote platform. But that's a great question because uh, it is something that's not on the warrant often, or never been on the warrant, I should say. No. But the point is to support the learning that takes place and support our teachers who are developing curriculum online. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Mayor, if I could make it to you, I have two more points quickly. Uh, on page, uh, what was it? 
there was one observation on page two, uh, Ms. Monahan, the, uh, the amount of $200 professional development, it's, it's charged to FY18, is that a typo or? The very last uh, line item on page two. I have it here as a, um, a professional development registration for one of our administrators. I do not see where you have um, FY18, I'm sorry. Oh, it says there, new FY18. I believe that is, uh, that is an error. Oh, okay, all right. And, I can definitely uh, confirm and get back to you. Okay, thank you. And the last uh, thing, Mayor, if I may, I would like to uh, respectfully vote present on page three, uh, voucher number 14371 in the amount of $2,592. Okay, thank you, Mr. DeMello. Thank you. Okay, so there was a motion made and seconded um, on a roll call vote. Yes. Will the mayor the motion amend the motion to include that? Is yes. that necessary? But uh, I'll, yeah, well, I just want to make sure Wendy has your recorded as present on that. Wendy, did you get that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So just to be clear, Mr. Souza, would you like to repeat the motion? The motion is uh, accept the financial law subcommittee report and adopt the recommendations of the subcommittee. And that would include Mr. DeMello's, uh, he's, he's going to vote present on that one article. And I'll amend the second to include that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mrs. Fagan, roll call please. Thank okay, you. Ms. Darty. Yes. Mr. Pulowski. Yes. Mr. Fiore? Yes. Mrs. Fagan votes yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Almeida? Yes. Mr. DeMello? Yes. And Mr. Souza? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Unit B, Administrators Subcommittee, Mr. Fiore? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the Unit B Subcommittee met this afternoon. Myself, Mr. Martin, Ms. Doherty, and the leadership team and the Union negotiating team, and I'm pleased to announce that we have a tentative memorandum of understanding with regard to protocols uh, dealing with the pandemic and the remote learning. Okay. Well, should we accept the report? Second. Second. Uh, motion made and seconded to accept the report on a roll call, please, Mrs. Fagan. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Pulowski? Yes. Mr. Fiore? Yes. Mrs. Fagan votes yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Almeida? Yes. Mr. DeMello? Yes. And Mr. Souza? Yes. Thank you. Secretaries and Assistant Subcommittee, Mrs. Doherty? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. The uh, uh, TESA, Secretaries and Assistant uh, Subcommittee met with the union on the 9th of September to agree upon ground rules, which we have completed uh, that discussion and are scheduled to continue our discussions uh, over the implementation of issues relating to um, COVID-19 schooling on the 23rd. Motion to accept the report. Second. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to accept the report on a roll call, please, Mrs. Fagan. Mr. D oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Doherty. Uh, yes, and uh, Mr. Fiore and Mrs. Fagan are also on that team, uh, and I vote yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pawlowski? Yes. Mr. Fiore? Yes. Mrs. Fagan votes yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Almeida? Yes. Mr. DeMello? Yes. And Mr. Souza? Yes. Thank you. And then Unit A, uh, memorandum, memorandum of Understanding, Mr. Souza. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Colleagues, uh, that was, this was inadvertently left off your agendas, so I just want to make sure that we get to this tonight. Um, before I get to that, I just want to remind all the chairpersons of each one of the bargaining units, make sure when you come to a memorandum of agreement that you bring it to the, to the uh, full committee, because uh, MASC uh, it recommends that we vote on that in a roll call vote. So they just wanted to remind everyone to bring that up. Um, so in front of you in a confidential envelope, everyone had a, a copy of the memorandum of agreement that took many, 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 uh, many meetings for myself, 
Mrs. Fagan and Mrs. Almeida, and as well as all the administrative team was always there. Um, we did it, we made it. Uh, if there's any questions, um, we can adopt it as written. If there's any questions, we would have to go into executive session. That's why I have the executive session on the agenda for later on in the meeting. If there's no questions and uh, everyone is fine with it, um, then we can adopt it by just a, a motion of the committee at this time. Uh, Mr. Mr. Crom to vote approval I just, of the I memorandum did. of agreement. I, I just wanted to let the committee know too. I, I believe I shared this with you in a previous email, but the TEA did approve the MOA uh, by a majority, which was 96% of the members approved the plan mm -hmm. as written, just so you know. Okay, thank you. Make a motion to adopt the memorandum of agreement. Second. Uh, and have the subcommittee chairman sign it on behalf of the committee. Okay, so the motion is to adopt. Um, you always have to have your two cents in there. The MOA and have the chairman sign it and second it um, on a roll I call did. vote. Please. I did. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, roll sorry. Ms. Darty? Yes. Mr. Kowalski? Yes. Mr. Fiore? Present. Oh, Mrs. Fagan votes yes. Mr. Martin? Present. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mrs. Almeida? Yes. Mr. DeMello? Yes. And Mr. Souza? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations for everyone. Thank you. Congratulations, administration. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, new business, MSBA, SOI. Um, Accelerated repair program. If I could, Madam Mayor. Mr. Cabral. I just want to start off real quick, as we have in the past. We, when we've come to this part, uh, this part with regarding statements of interest and feasibility studies, that I just want to go on record and also reiterate to the school committee and also to the public that we're not asking the city of Taunton to commit any dollars at this point. All we are asking is to pursue a feasibility study to identify the costs associated with replacing the doors and windows at the Galligan School, so that we can make an informed decision down the road and work with our city uh, in the event that this is something we can't pursue. However, we understand, we understand that there are many city projects and we're in the middle of a pandemic that replacing the windows at the Galligan School may not be feasible at this time or in the near future, but I think it would be wise for this group to, to, as they have in the past, to allocate the resources needed to do the feasibility study so that we can make an informed decision as a group. And again, I want to go on record as saying, I am not asking the mayor or the city of Taunton to commit any dollars to this project. This is just for us to explore and see what are the costs associated with replacing those windows and doors at the school, which is a building that I see us utilizing for many years to come either as an elementary school or in some other capacity down the road. Mr. Souza? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, do we have a cost associated with this and where would the funding come from? Great question, Mr. Souza. So in, in the past, uh, feasibility studies have ranged. Uh, the last one that we did was for the alternative high school. That was to replace doors, windows, and a roof. And that, that facility is much larger than the Galligan School. So I would think a motion not to exceed 85,000 without the approval of the school committee would be appropriate because I think the feasibility study would come in lower. And if it does come in higher, then I would discuss it with this, with this group and the mayor. Move Is the that recommendation of the superintendent. Through, through you, Madam Mayor. I don't. Go ahead, Mr. Souza. Thank you. Um, so, is this going to come from the revolve? What section of the revolving account would this come from? Great, great question. This could come out of the user facility uh, revolving account, or it could come out of the um, student the school choice because school choice can be used for enrollment. And and that, and that came and that yeah, yeah that they just reimburse they just uh, did we get our reimbursement from the state yet on that? Uh, we haven't received the reimbursement from the state yet, but at the next school committee meeting in October, we will provide you with a quarterly report and a closeout report for fiscal twenty. So this uh, September, this is, a, this is a date here. So we have to have our, our interest saying that we're still interested by the 21st. 
And so if we don't, uh, some reason, Mr. Cabral, you froze up. Am I moving now? Yes, you're good. Yeah, I believe all I'm asking for now is just a commitment on our part that if we do pursue this, if the city does wish to pursue it, uh, that we would cover the cost of the feasibility study as we have in the past. Uh, we've had a great working relationship with the city on these MSBA projects. We understand mm -hmm. that the 20% or the 24, 26%, depending on reimbursement, comes to the city, and this is something they have to bond and budget for. And again, we're just looking to see what the cost would be, and we'll do our share to cover that feasibility cost. And if it's something the city can do, I great. If they can't, we understand and no ill will will be held. I, I understand that. I, I'm just, I'm also concerned that uh, we may have some, uh, we had an HVAC study done and, and we may have some repercussions because of that as far as uh, uh, repairs and things like that. We, although we don't know yet because that's just, just came in. Um, yeah, yeah, just trying to just trying to see if we're doing our um, yeah regarding the HVAC, money wisely regarding the HVAC repairs we're going to be utilizing two federal grants to cover those costs so, so we won't have to go to the city for that money or we don't know yet oh uh, I mean if if the city had COVID relief funds and they wanted to utilize those COVID relief funds to assist with any retrofitting in our buildings then obviously we would welcome that but we we were given a uh, 3.6 million dollars from the federal government to assist with our PPE and to assist with any retrofitting. So we've purchased six months of PPE. Uh, we're using that funding to pay for our HVAC tests, which I have a meeting with James Quaintance tomorrow and the vendor to start reviewing the reports and the action that will be needed. So I feel comfortable knowing that we have the COVID uh, federal grants or federal monies to cover any costs associated with purchasing filters, air purifiers, um, getting the exhaust fans reconnected uh, based on some of the recommendations we're seeing. All right, I'll yield the floor so I, my colleagues can, can, uh, can talk so I can listen to them as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Souza. And, and just so everyone knows, I'm trying to put your names in the chat as I see you raising your hand so that you don't have to keep raising. So it'll be uh, Mrs. Almeida, then Mr. Mar, and then Mr. DeMello. Okay, so there's no discussion because there's no motion on the floor, correct? Is there a motion right. on the floor? No. So I will make a motion to move the superintendent's recommendation so I can go on discussion. Thank you. Second. Thank you. On discussion, Mrs. Almeida? Thank you. So in your opinion, Mr. Cabral, this is a good idea? I think it serves a couple purposes. Uh, one, it'll provide us with the costs associated with doing this type of project. Mm -hmm. two, um, the MSBA has been great to time. Uh, we have a new roof at that building, thanks to the MSBA, uh, which only cost the city 20% uh, of mm -hmm. the actual cost. So we'd be able to do our due diligence and better inform, you know, uh, better work towards providing that building with new windows, uh, which is something that I don't know if the city of the school department can do that without the assistance of the MSBA. And again, I wanna reiterate, I understand that there are other projects that need to be done in the city. And, um, and I, I mean, um, I'm grateful for well, this. I think in the long run, it's gonna be a cost savings because if you have new windows, that's gonna save money on heat and electricity and so forth and so on. So I think it's a good idea. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Martin. Yes, when I read this in the agenda, I looked at it the following way. Again, I realized the constraints that were under with, with COVID and the other buildings in the city. But I have no problem pursuing it because I treat this like I would treat a bid. And we go out to bid for something. If, if the prices come in off the wall, we reject all bids. But we're not going to know unless we try to see what it's, what's involved. So by submitting this, if it gets accepted, they're going to come back. The city, the school department is already committed to paying for the feasibility study, depending on how much it's going to cost. And we can go from there. But if we don't pursue it, we're never going to know. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Mr. DeMello. Thank you, Mayor, uh, through to Mr. Cabral. Uh, feasibility studies uh, is one of those uh, couple of words that always scare me. So you're estimating that no more than $85,000 uh, 
would be more than enough to do the study or should it be a lot less based on the comparison to the alternative school? You know, I think it'll come in, I believe it'll come in a lot less than the 85,000 of the alternative high school because it's a smaller facility and the, uh, the scope of work is not as intense as it was at the alternative high school. Right, thank you. And uh, the, other, the other thing I consider is uh, longevity. Uh, the Galligan School I'm not as familiar with as many of our other school buildings. Um, the use of building long term, I mean, are we looking at a five, 10 year plan? I don't know the physical condition of it as much as some other properties. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, that building is in great shape. Uh, it's been very well maintained. The addition of the new roof has added many years to that building. Uh, the heating system, it's an older system, but according to Mr. Pappas, it works very well and it's easy for him to him and his assistant to, to maintain. So I see that building being, being in uh, the rotation for a long period of time. I don't see that building going away anytime soon. Could I see it possibly being repurposed down the road if all the projections regarding our enrollment continue to trend down the way the MSBA and uh, NESDEC have indicated? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I could see it being repurposed. Uh, for, for, for another reason, but I don't see that building being closed in the foreseeable future. Great. And one last comment, Mayor, if I may. Uh, how, how do we treat the savings for the Mulcahy building, the $6.4, $6.5 million? Is that money that is on our bank account that we could use to this project? I mean, how, how does that all work? It goes back to the state. Uh, I can't answer that question because the city funds that project. That would probably be a question for uh, Barbara Ogier. Or um, Enos. Point of information: That money goes back to MSBA, which you don't use. Not the entire amount, because it's only a certain percentage, right, Mayor? Right. I can have um, Barbara write you all a letter of explanation on that, but that would be money that the city does not have to expend, borrow, and expend. So it would be a savings to the city, money not expended. So it wouldn't be just sitting in the bank account for us to use on whatever we want. Gotcha. Thank Pretty you, Mayor. Thank I should you. probably yeah. provide you with a better explanation. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mayor. Mayor. I think the short answer is they just never borrowed the money because the bid came in six million under. I think you're right on the money. I think that right. that's it, it would be happened. money not borrowed, yes. Mrs. Fagan? I'm sorry, Mayor O'Connell. Every time I try to hit the chat, and I'm not sure how to do that, I minimize the screen, so I had to raise my hand. I'm not that sophisticated yet. I do have a, um, a, just to raise a point, one of the things for some reason we got talking about this morning at Mosquito Control because some of the work that some of these other gentlemen do that are on that committee, that uh, yeah, thing with me, the board of uh, directors, they talked about the windows in so many schools that can't open. And it seems from the conversations they were having that that and ameliorate the problems you're having with bad air and stuff. And it's a shame that they started making everything sealed up so tight. So I, I, I don't know, I just thought I should let you know that because it was kind of like an interesting sideline of a conversation as we were uh, finishing the meeting. But th they all talked about that, about HEPA filters and getting windows back into the building. So I don't know if you must be aware of that, Mr. Cabral or Mayor O'Connell, somebody that that's that could be a real benefit and make sure the window's open. Yeah, I, I don't know the, the status no. of the windows at that school, whether or not they open. No, Mrs. Mrs. Fagan, you raise, you raise a good point. So the, the, you know, the introduction of OA outside air uh, is very important to mitigating uh, any, any virus or any flu or, or virus. So I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah, they, they were all talking about, because one of the guys works for Bayer and they do the pesticide branch, but they, there's, these are all things they encounter in doing their work. And you know, they have to worry about too well how they're contaminating the air. But they were basically all saying the same thing that this push to keep everything sealed up tight so you could save on heat or whatever has also created problems that the airs in the buildings do get stale and God knows what's in them. So I just thought it was interesting, but if that's another reason to vote for it, I should have supported it. So thank you. Um, so the, the city has invested uh, a great deal of money into our schools over many years and, and rightfully so with, of course, um, the last one being our beautiful new Mulcahy School. Uh, and every time a project comes up, it is 
you know, 80% paid by the MSBA. It's such a great deal. How could you not do it? It's hard to not do. And I think that's one of the reasons that we are probably about 40 years overdue for a new public safety facility um, that just keeps getting put aside and put aside and put aside because we fund other things instead. So uh, our priority is uh, a new public safety facility. Our police officers and firefighters are in desperate need of that um, in the conditions that they're working in. And so we are working very hard on that and I want to let everyone know that. Um, there, there will certainly be other rounds of MSBA funding that we can apply for. Um, and so I just want to leave the school committee with that as you move on to your vote. So any other questions? And if not, we can move on. So Mrs. Uh, Almeida had a motion to support the superintendent's recommendation. Was there a second on that? Uh, Mr. Martin seconds that. Okay. All right, so there was a motion made and seconded. And Mrs. Fagan on a roll call vote, please. Yes, Ms. Doherty. Yes. Uh, Mr. Pulowski? Mr. Pulowski? Yes. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. Mr. Fiore? Yes. Mrs. Fagan votes yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Almeida? Yes. Mr. DeMello? Yes. And Mr. Silva? You're muted. He's working on it. Oh, okay. Shake <laughs> your head. I saw him form the word. None of these electronics are working tonight. No matter what button I push. Uh, yes. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Unfinished business and action item updates. Are there any action item review updates? Mr. Martin? Under unfinished business. I know that the administration is working on a hybrid model to get us back to uh, in-person education. And some comments that have come to my attention from parents is, I believe the model we were given or talked about earlier was a transition. Mr. Cabral, is that how you mentioned it? We do first grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, or something like that. Correct. We would uh, transition the new learners and new rising learners. learners. Well, I'd like to, you to consider, okay, if I'm the only one member, but I'd like you to consider bringing back grades K to four as a group. I think these young kids need to be in person, uh, learning how to read, things like that, learning how to use a, a computer, the older kids, the middle school kids, the high school, definitely the high school kids, they're proficient in, in using a computer. They've been using them for years. These elementary students, you know, the, there's a great difference, age difference of, uh, you know, 10 to 12 years in some of these cases. They don't have the experience that these older kids have using a computer because computers obviously have been around for a long time. And I know that, you know, some of the third graders and fourth graders can take your cell phone and make it do magic tricks, but I still think that they have difficulty using a computer, following directions, even reading the directions as to what to do uh, with the material that's presented to them. So I'd like you to consider uh, in putting your hybrid model together that we bring back the elementary program entirely. And then even, even you know, maybe hold off on the middle and high school, but at least get those youngsters back in person so that the teachers can actually meet with them and you know, teach them, answer their questions, read to them, things like that. So, again, that's my that's my concern. Yeah, so, Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Mon, if I could just real quick. Um, so again, we're collecting a lot of information. We're, we're getting a lot of data, a lot of C data, as well when we visit our school. So um, yes, when we when we put our plan together initially, it was about the rising learners, new learners, getting them into our buildings. When I, so again, a hybrid option will be flexible. And as we learn new information, we, we can adapt and we can adjust. And if it means doing something such as that, we will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. I think, you know, one of the questions I keep hearing is we're, we're using data, we're collecting information, but what information are we collecting? And when do we know when we're going to get to the point where we have all the information we need? Um, what is that? 
that point is uh, questions we keep getting emails from parents and calls and things like that. So people just don't understand what we're what we're waiting for because they see that we're in the green. We've been in a prolonged period of decline. I, I myself understand uh, starting hybrid for a short period of time and seeing what happens and then bringing back the kids to school. But I completely agree with Mr. Martin that we should get back the young kids in here as, as soon as we possibly can. And then I think move right on to the middle school kids as well. Um, and whose hand did I just see up? I'm sorry. Ms. Doherty. Uh, Mrs. Doherty? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. And it's probably along the same lines that you're talking about regarding the, the, um, the in the plan, Superintendent, I know that you have a plan for informing us after a period of time about moving forward to a hybrid model. Uh, notwithstanding the suggestion that Mr. Martin has made, will you, will you start talking about what the next step is? You're clearly going to give us updates every school committee meeting. Uh, do you have any sense, would you start talking about this in mid-October as we near the end of the first phase um, of the current remote learning? Is there a sense of when, when we'll start talking about what the next steps might be? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So the next steps will obviously be to uh, start communicating with you, uh, the schedule we plan to follow. And uh, I think some of you may have received a letter from the commissioner regarding um, some, of the, some of the benchmarks that we should be waiting for before we change the phase, if you haven't received that, I can share that with you. And again, a lot of it is gonna depend on one, getting our remote plan down under our belts, which we're three days in and things are going well. A lot of it will depend on the work we need to do in our buildings to ensure we have you know, HVAC systems that are working you know, to the standard that they're supposed to be working. And then we'll communicate with our parents, giving them a sufficient notice and when we plan to start bringing students in. So October is a month that we're looking at uh, as far as starting to bring our students back. But again, a lot of it is gonna depend on our ability to do so safely and our ability to make sure that we have a comfort level with our remote. And I think right now with our remote plan, I feel like we're ahead of where I expected us to be with our remote plan. But again, some teachers may think differently, but overall, from what I've been seeing during my visit, it's going better than I expected. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DeMello? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, along those lines, I also I think uh, Mr. Martin's uh, initiative and Mrs. Doherty's support of it is also something I would like to uh, uh, really grasp. But let's not exclude our, our middle schoolers. I, I think that's a, an age that is uh, one of the toughest ages that uh, should also be incorporated. And I fully understand that there is a plan in place and getting a full grasp of the remote technology is key. Because as we all always mentioned, should there be an outbreak and we have to go back to the remote, we've got a great handle on it. So I think that, you know, collectively we will come to a consensus. But since we're talking about uh, kindergarten through grade four, I think we should also consider the middle school aged children too. Thank you, Mayor. And if I could just add one more piece too. Um, and I think I've said this enough and I just want to make sure there isn't this misconception. When we do go hybrid, students are still gonna be learning remotely for three days. Wednesday will be a full remote day, but depending on what cohort they're in, they'll be remotely Monday and Tuesday, or they'll be learning remotely on Thursday and Friday. So just when, when, when we talk about hybrid, it's not everyone's coming back to school four or five days a week. It's gonna be in-person learning for two out of the five days, and three days will be remote. Just so people understand what the hybrid means. Some districts have done it differently, some districts have done one week on, one week off, but the common model that we're seeing is two, one, two. Uh, thank you, Mr. Farrell. Mr. Souza? Uh, Mr. DeMille, you, you all set, right? Uh, thank you, thank you, Greg. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, geez, I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> um, Mr. Cabral, I was, I was going to ask something about the remote model, but uh, I forgot what it was. I'm, I'll take it on the next, uh, after Mr. Martin, just let me think about it for a second. Okay, we'll come back. Mr. Martin? Uh, I don't disagree with Mr. Mr. DeMello, you know, with the, uh, with the middle schools. And I wasn't trying to exclude anyone. I just, you know, again, I'm going based on what people are telling me. 
you know, they're saying they need to get these elementary kids because a lot of them, that's what they learn how to read. And, you know, the, the, the teacher student contact is not the same. And by the same token, I just want to mention, I've got a college freshman class. That's one year removed from the high school seniors and they're doing fine. It's not great. You know, we'd like to be in person, but they're doing fine. They're asking questions, they're doing their work, and, uh, and you know, they're doing the best they can. And, and I'm, mention, I'm mentioning that only because they're only one year removed from being a high school senior. So I think, you know, the high school kids, for the most part, are doing okay. I, I just, I'm very concerned about the elementary. Thank you, Mr. Thank you again for listening to me. Mr. Souza. Uh, thank you, Professor Martin, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I did remember what I wanted to say. Uh, Mr. Cabral, you know, you said something and, and it, it, it struck me because I think there's still a misconception out there. And um, you know, even after reading your re-entry plan, there's still a misconception on there on, on exactly what's going to happen. I think it's very important to, un to people to understand that kids are only going to go in the class two days a week because of the, of the size of the classrooms, because that's a state mandate. That's not, that's nothing to do with us. But I think it would be helpful if we, if we put out a one page sheet, don't call them cohorts either, because some people don't know what that means. Group, group A, group B, group C, group D. Um, and it's a very simple explanation. Now we, we don't know the data gonna, they're gonna go back and we all understand that. However, if we have some kind of a scenario on there where this is how it's going to lay out kind of a game plan, a loose game plan, I think people would understand that. I still think people think the kids are going back five, four or five days, and, and that's not going to happen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Souza. Okay. Any, uh, Mr. Pulaski? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I agree with most of what my, my colleagues have said. So I, I think we would all agree that we want, we want as many kids back in school as soon as we possibly can. And the only reason not to bring them all back at once is a numbers game. You have to minimize the amount of kids in, in the school to keep them adequately separated. So um, I think when we can bring kids back, I 100% agree with bringing the rising learners in first kindergarten, the fifth grade, the eighth grade, because uh, the community part of school, teachers and students, the relationship between them in front of each other, that's the most important thing. And I can't think of a reason to bring kids into one school and not another. So kindergarten, fifth grade, eighth grade, get the youngest rising learners into all the schools first. And then exactly what Mr. Martin said, the youngest students uh, should, be, should be the priority after that, the kids that need the action, that, that benefit the most from the uh, the in-person learning, but um, I know we're going to do it in the safest, most logical seeing the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pulaski. Okay, any other unfinished business? Okay, moving on. Any uh, critical items not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance? Okay, seeing none. Do we need an executive session? Madam Mayor, the executive session is not necessary. Okay, excellent. Okay, there is no press time. And we are at magic. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, please, Mrs. Fagan. Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Pawlowski? Yes. Mr. Fiore? Yes. Mrs. Fagan votes yes, Mr. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Almeida? Yes. Mr. DeMello? Yes. And Mr. Souza. Yes, have a great week, everyone. Stay safe. Thank Good you, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. 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 Good night.